Welcome to Westview, where life change happens. Holiday Club is finally here. Our leaders move in today and the fun-filled chaos erupts tomorrow with the children joining us for the week. We would like to thank you, our Westview family, for all your love, prayers and support in making a free holiday club possible. Though we cannot mention everyone by name, we'd like to thank the following. The Ditejo House of Laughter, the Morning and Evening Women's Auxiliaries, the Men at Work, the Friendship Club, the Women's Manano, and every member of the congregation who made a donation, either monetary or through supplies. We could not have done it without you. The year is nearly at an end and the silly season is in full force. With all the festivities ahead, we just want to remind you of service times over the Christmas period. On Sunday, the 24th of December, our services are at 8 and 10 a.m. We also have our evening crib service, which starts at 6 p.m. On Monday, the 25th of December, our services will be at 7.30 and 9 a.m. On Sunday, the 31st of December, our services are at 8 and 10 a.m. Our online services for the 24th, 25th and 31st of December will premiere at 8.30 on our YouTube channel. Please follow us on our Facebook, TikTok and Instagram pages or visit our website at www.westview.org.za. But don't keep us a secret, share our content with your friends and family. Greetings friends and welcome to worship. I now invite us to just still ourselves as we prepare to worship God together. In a few moments time I'm going to read a call to worship and then after that I'm going to lead us in the prayer to light the Advent candle and then invite you to respond uh, by reading those parts that will appear on the screen. And so our call to worship is from Psalm 30, and we read together from verse 5. The deepest pain may linger through the night, but joy greets the soul with the smile of morning. And so as we light this candle, we thank God for the gift of joy, and we commit to be joy bringers in a world that is so often filled with sadness and grief. We pray together. We thank you God for your advent here among us and for the joy it brings to our hearts. We open ourselves to your spirit of joy once again and we offer you our whole selves in thanksgiving and worship. Amen. And so friends, we worship God together in song.
in our more cynical or despairing moments, God, we wrestle with faith and with the idea of you coming to us. But somewhere in our hearts, we know that you do not need to come because you have always been here with us, among us, within us. And so now we welcome you again and we acknowledge that you need no welcome. It is we who need to remember, who need to see again your presence, who need to allow your with usness to flood our hearts and our lives. Welcome to our world, Jesus. But more importantly, we thank you for welcoming us into your ever coming, always present world. Amen. The time has come now for the joy of giving. Westview's banking details are on the screen. You can choose to make your offering now or you can wait until after the service. Hello Westview. Let us give thanks for these tithes and offerings. As we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, we seek to honor you with these monetary gifts. We know that everything in this world is a gift from you, O oh God. So we humbly return a generous portion of these gifts to you. Amen. And so our first scripture reading comes to us from the book of Ruth. We read together from the opening chapter, reading from verse 1 to about verse 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Opa and the other one named Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as we have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again, then Opa kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, 
be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so now we go to our second reading, which is from the Gospel of Matthew. And again, we read together from chapter 1, reading just verses 1 to verse 5. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nasen, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse. This is the word of God, and thanks be to God for this word. Amen. Friends, the, the Christmas story that is found in Scripture, particularly as found in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is a story that is just filled with joy. In fact, the biblical themes of joy which are found throughout the Bible reach their high point at the birth of Jesus Christ. And so everywhere you turn, especially in the Gospel of Luke, you find this idea of joy. And so joy to the world, joy to the world, we sing on Christmas that the Savior has come. But the truth is that there are seasons and times in lives when we do not want to sing joy to the world. These are times when we do not feel like singing joy to the world because we don't feel the joy. And maybe you are uh, in such a season uh, in your own life during this time right now. And so in those moments when we do not feel like singing joy to the world, the joy that is promised to us on Christmas seems to be cruel or sometimes even misplaced. But today we want to talk about how we can find joy or about how we find joy in the midst of those dark moments and those dark seasons in our lives. Today I want to talk about the theology of joy and how in the Bible we discover that it is possible to experience joy in the midst of darkness. And then I want to encourage you to choose joy by the time we finish today. Now, when we talk about joy, we need firstly to define what we mean by joy. Now, some dictionaries define joy as a noun. They define joy as a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. And I think we can all relate to that definition of joy as a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. When we talk about joy, we tend to talk about it as this joyful feeling in response to something really great that has happened or that we have experienced. Maybe as we begin this message, may I invite you to just take a moment and think about the one thing that brings you the most joy, that happiness and pleasure in your life. Just spend a moment and think about the one thing that brings you joy in your own life. You see, in my own life, I have noticed that I experience joy not from things, that the most time when I experience joy, it is not from things, but it is mainly from relationships. I have experienced that joy comes mostly from relationships rather than from things, which is a good reminder 
uh, for those of you who are still going to do your Christmas shopping, that is you think about what you are going to buy for your loved ones for Christmas and how much uh, you're going to spend on whatever that you are going to buy. May you also consider how much joy you want to give to those loved ones. And so maybe joy really is not so much about things, but it is about relationships and it is about experiences with people. It is not so much about the things that we can wrap in a box and put a ribbon upon it or cover them with nice uh, gift wrapping papers. Joy comes not from things, but joy comes from relationships. But even as I say that, I would be the first one to admit that, of course, there are things that bring us joy too. So here's the thing. If joy is only defined as what brings us pleasure and happiness in the moment, it means that we are then in trouble because those things that give us joy in the moment will not always be around us. Those, thi those things will not always be available to us. And so then, where are we going to find joy in between when those things are not available or around us? You see, here, this is where the Bible becomes helpful because the Bible then offers us another way of thinking about joy. And in the Bible, joy is, of course, sometimes that exuberant feeling that you have. But most often in the Bible, joy is a disposition of the heart. It is a way of being that is so closely tied to gratitude. And so the third Sunday of Advent is generally known as the Sunday of joy. It is in this third Sunday that we light this candle, which is different from the other candles. We light this rose candle or pink candle as the candle of joy. And so it is against this backdrop then that we turn to the third woman, uh, to the third woman in Matthew's genealogy. This woman is Ruth and she has a legacy of joy. Now her story begins in hardship and heartbreak. Naomi, who is Ruth's mother-in-law, has just endured famine, the death of her husband, and then a decade later, the death of both her sons. This left her alone in a foreign land with only the two Mobawite daughters-in-law. And so she decided then to return home to Israel. But when she tried to send the young women back to their families, Ruth refused to go back to her family. In spite of her grief at the loss of her husband, Ruth insisted on returning with Naomi to Israel. Now, what, what we need to be asking ourselves then is what really made Ruth to choose to leave her home as well as her family and to go and live as a widowed foreigner in Israel with her mother-in-law. Could it be that somehow Ruth was able to believe that the world still contained possibility, that the world still contained goodness and beauty? Could it be that she recognized the greater grief that Naomi, her mother-in-law, had endured and felt compelled to care for Naomi? Could it be that she chose to see Naomi as family and as a beloved companion in their shared grief? Could it be that she saw herself, even in her pain, as still capable of life and meaning and joy? Whatever reason, there can be little doubt that Ruth's choice to stay connected and to find purpose in caring for Naomi contributed to her courage, to her sense of purpose, but also to her capacity to build a new life in a foreign land for herself and for her mother-in-law. And so rather than being defined by her grief, 
rather than losing herself in misery, bitterness, and hopelessness. Ruth chooses a life of love, a life of compassion, and a life of purpose. And in all of that, she found joy. But the joy that Ruth discovered and the joy that Ruth embodied in her life was not just for herself. Her commitment not to give up on life, love, and joy ensured that she was able to bring joy to Naomi too. And so she gave Naomi a new sense of purpose in being her mentor as she navigated life and customs in that uh, adopted homeland. And when she and Boaz had their first child, Ruth allowed Naomi to be his guardian and the women of the neighborhood said, a son has been born to Naomi. And so I hope you can begin to see that grief may have stolen the happiness of Ruth and Naomi, but grief could not steal their joy. Together, they chose joy through a life of connection, a life of care and purpose, a life that ensured that grief did not have the final say in their lives and that it did not come to define who they were. There is so much that you and I can learn from the legacy of Ruth, this widowed immigrant who found a life of joy in the face of grief by caring for her grieving mother-in-law, which is then why Ruth becomes one of the ancestors of Jesus, who also becomes the Messiah of joy. Now, as we look uh, at Jesus, one of the things we will discover is that in his gospel, as Matthew presents Jesus as the promised Messiah, he includes Ruth not just as a great-grandmother of David, but he includes Ruth as a woman who left a legacy of joy. And it was a legacy that shaped Matthew's vision of Jesus as a Messiah and that of the other gospel writers as they too hang on to this idea of Jesus as the Messiah. You see, from the moment of his birth, Jesus' life and person radiated joy. In the Gospel of Luke, Elizabeth proclaimed that John leaped for joy in her womb at the sound of Mary's greeting. And Mary declared that she was filled with joy at being the mother of Christ. And the angel told the shepherds that the announcement of Jesus' birth was good news of great joy. In Matthew's Beatitudes, Jesus spoke a blessing over those who are persecuted and invited them to rejoice and be glad in the midst of their pain. And in John's Gospel, Jesus' last words to his disciples contain numerous references to the joy that Jesus wants to give to his disciples. Now, the joy in Jesus and the joy he sought to give to his friends was unrelated to circumstances. It was far more than just a happy feeling. In fact, it was a way of being fully alive, connected, and positive, even in the face of grief, in the face of pain, and in the face of struggle. This was the way of joy that Ruth embodied. Like Ruth, Jesus found and shared joy through life, through the life of connecting with and caring for other people and helping them to find meaning joy and purpose as well. Even as he died in an excruciating pain, Jesus was able to share words of joy and comfort with the dying thief on the cross besides him. And as he looked down from the cross, he expressed his love for his mother by ensuring that she would be cared for after his death. All of these, these are acts of joy and joy bringing in the midst of extreme pain and grief. 
And so as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, our focus is not on Jesus alone. Jesus' life and work were all about the reign of God, and that reign of God is the reign of joy. And so if our faith makes us miserable, if our faith makes us angry and full of hatred and judgment, it is not the joyful and vibrant faith of Jesus Christ. If our faith is only about waiting for life to begin in heaven after we die, then it is not the joyful and vibrant faith of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus may have been, as Isaiah says, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But Jesus was also simultaneously a man of joy, a man who was acquainted with laughter, beauty, optimism, purpose, and connection with other people. Jesus also sought to always bring joy to those around him. And so as we sing joy to the world, as we celebrate the birth of the Christ, let us also embrace the legacy of joy, the legacy of Ruth. Let us embody Jesus' call to be people of joy and let us strive to be joy bringers to family, friends, as well as neighbors. Let us not settle for shallow and temporary happiness. Let us give ourselves to the quest for that deep and lasting joy that comes from an abiding sense of purpose, meaning, connection, and aliveness. And let us believe that joy and life can still exist and thrive and empower us even in our darkest, most sorrowful times. And so the invitation really of this third Sunday of Advent, it is an invitation to choose joy. You see, Ruth's life could have ended when her husband died and Naomi chose to return to Israel. She could have gone back to her family and hoped for a new husband. Or she could have become dis she could have just become a disillusioned and a bitter old woman who never let go of the grief that life had thrown at her. She could have been defined by her pain, by her sorrow, and by her struggle. But Ruth chose differently. And the same applies to you and I. Whenever we go through these seasons and moments when we do not feel like we want to sing joy to the world, the Savior has come. We can choose joy. We can make a different choice. And like Ruth, we can make the same choices. You see, joy is not just going to happen to us. Joy is a daily conscious decision to reject cynicism, to reject despair, and to reject bitterness. It is a choice to be intentional about the ways which we use and the interpretations we place on the world, on the people around us, and on ourselves. And it is a determination to connect with and share life with others as best as we can. And so I want to end me by just inviting you maybe to think about what are some of the things that could lead you to reject joy. In other words, what makes you feel that joy is no longer an option for you? What robs you of life, of possibility and meaning? And what would it take for you to cling to joy and to choose joy little by little, day by day, and to do the things that keep you alive and filled with joy, even in your most sorrowful of times? You see, embracing joy may not always be the easy choice. It may not even be the natural choice. It may not even be the choice that we want to make. But choosing joy is the choice that saves us from the devastation of bitterness, of self-pity, and becoming defined and consumed by the pain that we all must endure. And so there is a cost and a challenge with every choice we make. But the choice for joy is always a better choice 
than any other choice or than any other alternative that we may think of. May God bless us as we choose joy. Amen. Just in reflecting this morning on the service, perhaps we can think about a few things. One of them is in what ways can we embody joy um, and the joy bringing legacy of, of Jesus in our own lives and in our relationships? Let's give that a, a moment, some silence and some thought. In what ways could we embody the joy bringing legacy of Jesus in our own life and in our relationships? to the world the Lord is come let us receive a King let every heart prepare His room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing And so, friends, we now join in together as we pronounce the words of blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace, go with joy, and become people who bring joy to the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen.